Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. With the Andor series right around the corner, I thought it'd be cool to look at some interesting concepts from the early Rebellion period. Today we'll be covering the topic of safe worlds, which was actually formerly a Legends concept that was brought into canon very recently through the Last Jedi's novelization. So in the early days of the Alliance to Restore the Republic, before the Rebs even got their first MC-80 Star Cruiser, the Alliance High Command set up a branch of their organization known as Support Services. Headed by the unkempt General Dustal Farrell, the support services were in charge of setting up a transportation network for the fledgling movement. This was not a glorious job, but it was an essential job. As we all know, logistics and supplies are what keeps any army moving. And with the Empire actively hunting down the Rebellion everywhere they appeared, this job became even more difficult as the war went on. One solution that the supportive services came up with was by creating safe houses on planets all across the galaxy. They would send out their scouts to remote areas of the galaxy and look for planets that they could basically set up their own operations on. After serving a planet for habitability and local settlements, the supportive services would set up a self-sustaining settlement with farms and water production. These worlds would be populated by injured and retired members of the Alliance military and the families of rebel soldiers, along with non-combat oriented rebels, political dissidents, defectors, pacifists, and anyone else who was allied with rebels but could not fight. Most of these settlements were kept very small so that their footprint would not alert the attention of Imperial scouts. On more remote worlds, the rebels would actually create Imperial penal colonies where basically Imperial POWs were given some basic farming supplies and left to their own devices. These were usually very remote areas so they couldn't escape anyway without you know, a starship. The supportive services had around a dozen GR-75 medium transports, one light freighter, and one light cruiser to run supplies between their tiny colonies. Eventually, many of these worlds would begin to produce excess food stuff that would supply the rebel army. Most of these worlds would be undefended and relied on the Empire not detecting them. Before we continue though, today we have a special guest appearing. Um, he's going to be representing Raid Shadow Legends, our sponsor for today's video. His name is Death Knight and, and, and he's, uh, he's, he's really freaking annoying. Why would you say that? Because it's true, you've just been complaining non-stop about how Raid Channel Legends has created an ultimate Death Knight legendary champion instead of upgrading you. Hey, we all know I'm the superior Death Knight. No, ultimate Death Knight is clearly superior to you. I mean, look at him. It's so, so wonderful and, and magnificent. Cle clearly better than you. I heard, I heard he doesn't pay his taxes. So that's not gonna stop people from using them. Everyone gets Death Knight for free as long as they log in to raid at least seven times before October 27th. I heard he only likes the bad Star Wars movies. Jar Jar Binks, anyone? My fans actually like the prequels. Can you just read the copy like you're supposed to, please? Ugh, fine, hold on. Okay, so. Enter the promo code DK Rises for a ton of free items to instantly upgrade Ultimate Death Knight to level 50, five star ascension, or whatever, I don't care, back to you. And for all of you guys who have never played Raid, check out the link in the description below for an amazing offer. Or scan my QR code here on screen. You'll get unique bonuses worth $30. We're talking about a free epic champion, Aina, 200,000 silver, one energy refill, and one XP boost, and one ancient shard so you can summon awesome champions as soon as you get in game. All of these prizes will be waiting for you in your in game inbox. Not all Rebel safe worlds were located in remote areas. One of the most famous safe worlds used by the Rebellion was actually Alderaan. Alderaan had long been a cultural center of the galaxy and the people valued education and arts far more than industry and political power. There was also a philosophy of pacifism widely adopted by the population that ran counter to the Galactic Empire's rapid militarization. Bail Organa, the Viceroy of Alderaan, secretly opposed Emperor Palpatine and his new empire and he would use his diplomatic immunity as an Imperial Senator to create the backbone of a resistance movement that would one day turn into the Rebel Alliance. Given the loyalty and support Organa enjoyed at home, Alderaan became one of the larger safe world settlements for the Rebel Alliance, and the Rebels began stockpiling weapons, munitions, and other supplies on the planet. But eventually Alderaan's luck would run out by zero BBY. It was very clear that the planet was providing strategic and political aid to the Rebel Alliance. 
Olaf Tarkin would use the Death Star to destroy the planet. The loss of Alderaan led to the death of Bail Organa, which placed Mon Mothma in charge of the rebel movement. It also destroyed an important rebel safe world right in the heart of the Empire. Raltair was the last core planet located on the Perlimian trade route in the DARPA sector. This terrestrial planet would serve as a major financial center in the galactic economy and would attempt to stay neutral in galactic politics in order to preserve its abilities to function as a stable banking center. After the Galactic Empire launched a brutal invasion of the planet and overthrew the local government, the Raltair resistance allied themselves with the rebellion and their planet became the movement's second safe world in the core. Next up, we have the world of Gutriti, also known as Isis. Located in the Anote sector near Hoth, this planet was located in the dead end of a dead end sector and could only be reached through a secret hyperspace lane passing the mining world of Burnin Khan, making it a relatively safe place for the rebels to station a starfighter hub. The planet of Gutriti was actually populated by a primitive species that hated off-worlders. The Rebel Alliance was able to hold them at bay with their advanced technology. The planet's surface was also littered with special crystals that dampen sensors and communication waves, making it ideal for concealing a rebel safe world. Chandrilla was the birthplace of Mon Mothma, the second most important rebel leader after Bail Organa. Her home planet was located in the Borneo sector of the core. This peaceful garden world had calm seas and rolling hills with relatively mild weather patterns making it ideal for agricultural pursuits. When the Empire took over the planet and appointed its own imperial governor to the sector, the Chandrillans were allowed to keep their own Chandrillan house, which was the democratic legislative body of their planet, and the senators would continue to oppose the Empire pretty openly. The Chandrillans were allowed this political luxury because they were a core world, and core worlds were still given a little bit of wiggle room when it came to freedom of speech. But because Mon Mothma eventually defected to the Rebellion and became the leader of the Alliance to restore the Republic, Chandrilla would end up on a short list of planets that would be targeted by the Death Star program. Luckily, Chandrilla would outlast both Death Stars and even Starkiller Base, and it would become a safe world for most of the Galactic Civil War. Despite its very remote location in the Outer Rim, Mon Cala was actually a very important world to the Galactic Empire. It had an advanced industrial base that produced some of the finest exploration ships in the galaxy, and its culture and exotic food goods were admired by people all across the galaxy, including Palpatine himself, who enjoyed Mon Calamari aquatic ballets. After the Clone Wars ended, the planet would become occupied by the Empire after a short invasion. But the reality was, aside from the blockade over the planet, the Empire really lacked control of Mon Cala because they didn't have the underwater forces necessary to truly occupy the world. And so the Rebellion would create a safe world settlement beneath the waves with the help of the local Mon Cala resistance. Eventually, a large portion of the Mon Cala merchant fleet would join the Rebel Alliance and form the backbone of the Rebel Alliance fleet. Mon Cala would become one of the top potential targets for both the first and second Death Star because of their priceless aid to the Rebellion. People say this is why Admiral Raddus was one of the first individuals to support the Rogue One mission on Scarif. Just to jump away from the Mon Cala system was the idyllic aquatic planet of Sanctuary. Dotted with tropical island chains, this was one of the oldest safe worlds used by the Rebellion and was established well before the Declaration of the Rebellion was even written and signed by Mon Mothma and the other rebel leaders. This planet was originally settled by religious pacifists who were trying to escape conscription into the Imperial military. This planet also attracted various alien refugees who were trying to escape the New Order's anti-alien policies. These first waves of settlers on Sanctuary would eventually strike up a deal with the Rebel Alliance. In exchange for some agricultural equipment to jumpstart their food production, these settlers would join the Alliance in non-combat roles and help set up a new safe world on their planet. Sanctuary would become one of the first Rebel safe worlds and by 2 ABY its population had grown to 29,000 people and had begun producing a surplus of food and other supplies that were used to feed the growing Rebel Alliance military.
Like Mon Cala, Kashyyyk was a planet that could never truly be tamed by the Galactic Empire. Instead of deep oceans here, you had deep jungles and forests that could hide entire cities from prying eyes. Located in the mid-rim, Kashyyyk was home to an important hyperspace intersection that led from the core regions out to the resource-rich outer rim. Shortly after the Clone Wars ended, the native Wookiees were betrayed by their clone allies who occupied the planet and enslaved the local population. An Imperial fleet would be brought over the planet and blockaded the entire system. Kashyyyk was a world rich in oil and exotic woods. It also produced a considerable amount of foodstuff for the Imperial military. The Wookiees were extremely loyal to the Jedi and Master Yoda during the Clone Wars and would continue to support the Rebellion through their own resistance movement against the Empire. Due to the thick and massive jungles on this planet, the Empire could really only control the areas around the shores of Kashyyyk's many seas. Wookiee War Chieftain Tarful would hide his resistance troops in the Shadowlands deep in the jungles of the planet and would routinely launch strikes against Imperial facilities throughout the rest of the war. Kashyyyk would be declared a rebel safe world despite the fact that the planet was heavily blockaded. Due to the heavy traffic of freighters that was leaving and approaching the planet extracting materials from Kashyyyk, the Rebel Alliance found it very easy to sneak past that blockade. New Plimpto was originally a core world planet allied with the Separatist Alliance during the Clone Wars. The native Nosarians lost the right to export Ricknick eggs onto the galactic market when the Ricknick species were declared protected by the Republic Senate. This was basically their only export. With the rise of the Empire, New Plimpto would be quickly occupied by the Galactic Empire. Given their location on key hyperspace lanes in the core regions of the galaxy, the Rebel Alliance would set up a safe world settlement on this planet. The planet of Solus was located in the outer rim on the busy Rima hyperspace trade route. The planet had large amounts of volcanic activity on its surface, making resource and mineral extraction relatively easy and cheap. Solus would become a major source for raw materials for the Imperial military. But like on many planets where aliens were in the majority, the Imperial overseers began to oppress the local population. And while most of the mining and extraction operations were running smoothly on the surface, beneath the surface there was growing discontent and you could see movements like the Cobalt Laborers Reformation movement growing. This especially became true after Imperial overseers began to squeeze the Solaston workers for more production as the war started to turn against the Empire. From pretty early on, elements of Solaston society would support the Rebel Alliance. This included source up corporations which helped Incom develop the X-Wing. Solus would become one of the early Rebel safe worlds as a result. Ordpar Drone was a tiny planet with a thin atmosphere and a low gravity. It was located in the Slice area in the Midrim territories. The Republic had heavily mined the planet, and due to its remote nature and easy-to-access minerals on the planet's surface, it became an ideal place to establish a Rebel safe world. So there you have it, guys. Those are 10 Rebel safe worlds uh, that were used by the Rebellion in those early days to basically recoup and resupply their very tired forces. Hopefully, we'll get to see some more Rebel safe worlds in the upcoming Andor series. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below. My name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy.